Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. We're very fortunate this afternoon to have uh, Andrew Shang talking about from Asia or from Asian to global financial crisis. Um, let me just, for those of you who are not familiar, say a little bit about uh, Andrew's background and then we can get rolling into the, uh, the lecture. Andrew, at the moment, is uh, senior, is, uh, is uh, chief advisor to the China Banking Regulatory Commission, a board member of the Qatar Financial Center Regulatory Authority, um, Sam Darby Behad and Kazana National Behad Malaysia. And on top of that, he's adjunct professor uh, for in Beijing and uh, in KL. In terms of Andrew's background, he spends a lot of time in Hong Kong, first at the Hong Kong Monetary Authority and then as chairman of the, uh, the uh, Futures and uh, Securities Commission. Um, he has great experience in terms of the officials in the official sector on issues to do with the uh, Asian financial crisis. As I recall, first meeting Andrew, I think, in 1998 when I was working with the IMF and the Financial Stability Forum, and we were looking into the role of highly leveraged institutions in Asia and in particular in the uh, Hong Kong uh, market. But look, anyway, we're, we're very fortunate to have Andrew here. Um, Andrew will speak for around, say, 40, 50 minutes, following which time we'll open the floor to questions. And could I ask, when you do raise questions, could you, number one, speak into the microphone, and number two, give your name and uh, where you're from. So thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Kishore Mabubani and, you know, Charles for uh, hosting this uh, uh, afternoon's lecture. I know it's a busy time for all of you. I, I, now that Professor Wang Gangwu, you know, one of the person I respect most on Asia is here, I, I'm in great trepidation. You know, he's the scholarly, scholarly type, and I'm the, as Charles says, jack of all trades, multitasking and uh, not necessarily good at anything. But I, what I've done you know, this afternoon is to weave together a story which I think is, uh, is quite important because I spent four years writing this book. Uh, and uh, let me give you the reason for it. The reason is that, I, first of all, I'm absolutely convinced Asia will take its rightful place in the global arena. Uh, but the Asian crisis was, to me, a very major testing ground. Uh, Chinese historian Ray Huang, who was a macro historian, says that uh, every generation, uh, China sort of, uh, you know, has to test through its agrarian roots before it can engage with the rest of the world. Uh, and I think Asia took that test in, uh, during the Asian crisis, and some people failed. So, uh, and had to be rescued. Uh, so this is the story of that. But the Asian crisis was very unusual. It was unusual because it um, signaled what I call the, the crisis of the 21st century. Uh, and uh, it, 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 is, it is very unusual because it is so networked together. And it's a phrase that uh, you will hear me you know, use all the time. Now, how do I move this? Ah, here we are. Very simple timeline, right? Probably the timeline should begin with 1985 with the Plaza Accord when U.S. and Japan had this, you know, uh, U.S.-Japan uh, trade deficit. The U.S. forced uh, Japan to revalue, or the, the Japanese willingly did it, and the result was, 
you know, the massive appreciation from 240 to 120 in two years. And then there became the mother of all bubbles the, uh, uh, in Japan. Uh, the uh, uh, property market went up I don't know how many times uh, until spectacularly, as everybody knows, uh, the Imperial Palace could uh, buy up the whole, the value of the Imperial Palace in Tokyo could buy up the whole of California. And the stock market reached uh, briefly exceeded market cap value uh, compared with the U.S. market cap, and it reached 39,400 points. And of course, uh, today, uh, it's, it, in, within uh, 18 years since it peaked, uh, it bottomed out at 6,008, and today is hovering around 10,000. So it's never recovered, you know, uh, uh, from its uh, peak. And property prices dropped 60-70%. Uh, uh, in terms of the timeline, uh, you know, the, the, after the Japanese market peaked, the Japanese made a very strategic decision to shift production uh, to its neighborhood. Previously, it has done exactly what China has done, put most of its savings in the developed markets. But after 89, it started shifting massively to East Asia, uh, which it considered its neighborhood. Um, and then, uh, you know, the rest of Asia had a bubble. Uh, and you can see that the timeline was 94, we had a Mexican crisis. 95, the Japanese yen peaks at 80. Uh, you know, by 96, Japan decided they had recovered enough to be able to increase its VAT to restore the fiscal deficit. What today is called an early exit. Unfortunately, the Japanese economy tanked. And by 1997, uh, by July, July you know, 1, uh, the part uh, got devalued. And then, you know, there was a whole chain reaction uh, of, uh, of, of failures, you know, Indonesia, Malaysia, you know, ultimately Indonesia, then, um, uh, then Korea. Uh, so uh, that crisis then rolled on into 98 until August when Hong Kong famously intervened. Uh, Malaysia immediately imposed exchange control. And then by September, Russia failed. Uh, Brazil uh, exploded. LTCM failed, uh, U.S. then lowered interest rates, and then by 1909, you know, the whole system recovered. So it kind of a uh, very quick uh, timeline. Um, yeah. Now, the common explanations are very straightforward. Um, you know, most books about the Asian crisis are written by non-Asians. It was very much the I told you so stuff. Asian miracle was, you know, mostly perspiration. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, relatively little, you know, uh, innovation, lot of, lots of cheap labor, impossible trinity, badly sequenced uh, financial liberalization, crony capitalism, uh, double mismatch. This is the most famous one. Borrow short, invest long, borrow foreign currency, invest uh, local currency, and then volatile capital flows, which led to very bad national risk management. This is the standard explanation of the uh, Asian crisis. Now, I think you need to put this whole thing in perspective because Asian crises tend to be explained, well, it's the victims. You know, you, 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 you succumb, therefore you are all wrong. Uh, but if you really look at it, the Asian crisis cannot be divorced from the Japanese crisis. It's actually one crisis. And, you, you know, slight sequential differences, but it was no coincidence that in 1997, by November, the first Japanese banks had, dis had, had failed. And um, the, the, if you really look at by 1995, you know, at the kind of peak, Japan was literally larger, uh, you know, than, than by GDP, the, 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 the rest of Asia. And had in 1995, at its peak, when the exchange rate was uh, uh, 80, 80, Japan was double the asset size of the rest of Asia put together. If you, again, if you look at China, it was peanuts. You know, I mean, it was uh, some hundred billion. Right? Uh, uh, so it was very small, and, you know, China was smaller than Korea, Indonesia, you know, Thailand, uh, Malaysia, and all this put together. So it's, uh, and, and if you, you add including Singapore, Singapore was hurt, but was not a, a crisis economy, so it doesn't feature in this story. But by and large, you cannot divorce this story from the Japanese crisis in perspective. Now, this crisis created a massive bubble. And then there was massive wealth loss, okay? Now, the, oh, the, unfortunately, you know, the standard economic theory, which
which is now completely put to the test, ignored the uh, balance sheet effects. We all looked at flows, savings flows, capital flows, you know, uh, 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 etc. But we didn't look at balance sheet. Now, as you know, balance sheet is the cumul cum uh, cu you know, a cumulative effect of flows, net flows, net flows. Now, uh, Nomura, Richard Kuhl, who said, uh, who's written this brilliant book about the balance sheet crisis of Japan, uh, has estimated that Japan lost the equivalent of US 10 trillion and roughly 2.7 times, you know, Japanese GDP. Uh, market cap loss was 55% of GDP. Ex-Japan lost 65% of GDP. All in, the losses were huge. Hong Kong alone, the equity and uh, property wealth loss, I calculated, was somewhere like three times GDP. So the losses were huge. Now, the really scary part is not so much stock market, uh, because stock market speculation is generally not that leveraged. It's actually real estate, because real estate is mortgaged, uh, and people borrow uh, to, to invest in that area. And when you have a bubble, you know, it, it can, uh, a massive property market crash can destroy the middle class. This was the Hong Kong threat. Uh, uh, you know, so the, the wealth losses were severe, and I will show you what uh, these were. Now, the bank failure losses were also huge. Roughly speaking, uh, the IMF calculations, World Bank, uh, you know, uh, uh, Astley, uh, Demirgut Kunt, uh, and uh, 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 Klingo and, 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 and Caprio and others calculated that the biggest loss within that group was Indonesia, which lost 55% of GDP. Massive cons consolidation thereafter. You know, the smaller banks got wiped out. Smaller finance companies got wiped out, and they got consolidated. But unfortunately, in Indonesia, they, they, they weren't fully And, you know, some of the, uh, 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 you know, there are still very, very, very large, you know, uh, large number of banks. So what were Asians' mistakes? The Asian mistakes clearly was weak corporate governance, uh, Korean you know, leverage was over 400% of uh, equity, uh, massive short-term debt. There was a large currency mismatch, which I told you about. Uh, the Koreans, uh, you know, uh, were the, f the best indicator, by the way, of financial crisis until very recently is newest member of the OECD, Turkey, Mexico, uh, South Korea, because they all liberalized too early. They, they thought they were, had already reached uh, developed country status. W come a, 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 uh, a capital flows crash, and they go down like nine pins. Now, the, what the Koreans did was that they had very dom tight domestic monetary policy, highly leveraged corporations. So because interest rates were very high, they went to Hong Kong and Singapore and borrowed offshore $60 billion that the Korean Bank of Korea didn't know, didn't, didn't know about. So there were two you know, sort of kind of black holes that we didn't know, roughly $40 billion worth of four transactions by the Bank of Thailand defending the BART and $60 billion uh, in the uh, Korean uh, offshore things. So the, the minute uh, they went to the central banks to ask for money, central banks didn't have it. A banking, a classic retail banking crisis became a currency crisis. So Asian crisis is essentially a regional crisis of traditional retail banking and currency crisis. That was lack of transparency, which I talked about. And basically, with the exception of Hong Kong, Singapore, weak uh, uh, fundamentals and supervision. But I think what everybody underestimated was actually these large capital flows. Now, I think in this area, I'm sorry to say I blame economists, because most economists uh, look at the history and say foreign direct investment equals good, Therefore, short-term capital flows, portfolio flows, must be good. What they forgot was that most of these capital flows were leverage flows. And these leverage flows, in a, in a world in which central banks are not leveraged, and the, so, if I may say so, the speculators are highly leveraged, is an unequal fight. Okay. So, you know, you know when the, the, the speculators can put down 3% and take, an, you know, 97% borrowing to speculate on the currency, the sheer momentum of speculation against the currency, if the central bank doesn't have their policies right uh, and they scare the locals to give up the currency, then you're dead. So uh, that was essentially what happened.
Now, the Washington Consensus uh, mistake was to underestimate the volatility of capital flows. The 97 annual meeting in Hong Kong, in which I was doing all the preparations, uh, was still talking about how to open up even further, capital liberalization further. Uh, you know, but they totally uh, you know, uh, 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 underestimated the spillover effects. Uh, the international you know, bank short-term lending issues rel relatively had not been understood. The high volatility of the dollar-yen impact on the carry trade, and that's the major discovery, is the carry trade. Okay? Because the carry trade is essentially uh, any, any currency that is under deflation basically lends anybody who is willing to speculate zero interest rate. And the more the money that's exported, the carry trader earns not only a positive carry, but a double whammy gain. Uh, you know, if I take borrow yen and put the money in baht, and the more money I put into baht, because it's a very small market, stock market, the more the stock market will bu bubble, I earn a positive carry of 10%, difference between yen interest rate and baht interest rate. And then, you know, if the yen were to depreciate, my liabilities depreciates, my asset increases, right? So I have a double gain. But when it reverses, it's a double loss for the time, right? And you've seen this whiplash effect when the, 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 the most famous uh, uh, carry, yen, yen carry trade currently is the yen Aussie dollar carry trade. When the September uh, 08 crisis reversed, the, the, the yen, the Aussie dollar went from you know, 50, uh, 90 cents to the, do, to the dollar down to 50 cents and has bounced back again. You know, I pity the uh, Mrs. Watanabe who speculates in that market, but there we are. So you know, the, the, the issue fundamentally was that the IMF was not geared to become the lender of last resort. It could not be because the major central banks won't let it be. And the Fed refused to be the lender of la dollar lender of last resort even though Asia was a dollar zone. And the reason for this is basically Mexico. When the U.S. Treasury in 1995 rescued, 1994 rescued Mexico, uh, the U.S. Congress said, no way will we allow you to do this again. And so therefore, basically, the, 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 the committee to rescue the world went into the, the rescue with their hands tied. Uh, and uh, therefore, that uh, basically you know, is a bubble, currency crisis, banking crisis, ultimately a political crisis. If you look through this book, Basically, what happens is this. The first chapter is a very quick overview. Most of you who buy books, like me, read the first chapter, read the last chapter, and ignore the rest. And afterwards, it's put on the shelf. And it, the book has been designed that way, OK? <laughs> the book has been designed that way. Because I'm a reader, so I know. But I have used, basically, local country sources where possible, right, for each country. I use the local sources. I don't, you know, I'm not a Westerner writing about an Eastern problem. I use, you know, in the Bank of Thailand, I use as much, you know, Thai, sorry, in the Thai case, I use as much Thai sources. Uh, the IMF, I use the, in, uh, the, uh, the, the independent evaluation reports. You know, in the uh, uh, Korea, I, as much as possible, I use Korean uh, explanations. And then I try and compare, you know. So it's the, 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 the central chapters, uh, you know, first of all, it, it goes somewhere like this. It goes uh, 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 first overview, then a, a very quick timeline. Then it explains Japan's role, and which is what I'm going to try and explain. That, that's why, because Japan is the biggest. You know, and then you know, it goes to the country chapters. And then I go into where the mistakes we made, and then how these same mistakes were made in this crisis, and where the differences are. Right? Now, the essential uh, uh, problems is that you know, Asia basically created the global supply chain. That's Japan's contribution to Asia. The first, you know, as you, you've heard about this, the, the flying geese theory, Japan was the first to industrialize, first to introduce the mercantilist export model, right? And then when yen you know, appreciated, they started shifting production to the four dragons. And then you know, when the four dragons got expensive, they shifted production to the uh, four tigers and then eventually to China, right? And so, you know, they were highly synchronized. They were highly synchronized, you know, and everything, you know, hinges upon, you know, Japan. So, you know, when the U.S. sneezes, that's the old story, uh, Japan catches cold and the rest of Asia gets pneumonia, right? This time round, it's very clear, the U.S. definitely has got more than a cold, right? Japan's still got pneumonia. I'm not sure what Asia has got, 
but uh, you know, but it's you know maybe it's stars or whatever it's equivalent. Uh, now, if you really look at you know the the the, the political fight between Japan and, uh, and and the U.S. and currently the same kind of simplistic argument over the issue that you know if there if U.S. is running a deficit, it must be due to you know you guys are pricing too cheap. But if you really look at the dollar yen, the yen has continually appreciated. Has done almost nothing for the current account. So the Chinese feel that you know, uh, uh, you know, this same thing is likely to happen. It's more structural, right? And this this is a debate that, uh, uh, for example, I have uh, when uh, when Ben Bernanke blamed the savings glut on Asia. I said this is a disingenuous argument because it's like a commercial banker blaming his non-performing loans on your depositors, right? You know, we individual depositors, you know, don't have any control over the, 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 the quality of the assets. We just lend money to you. Now, maybe, you know, the st global structural problem is problematic, and that's the fundamental problem. Actually, the U.S. Fed de facto runs the monetary policy for the rest of the world, but it suffers from what is known as the Triffin Dilemma, in which the monetary policy for the rest of the world need not be the monetary policy for its home country, especially when the rest of the world is growing faster, the U.S. as the reserve currency must run a current account larger than it's needed. The real danger is when it runs too large, then you get this global imbalance. And that's the responsibility not of the rest of the world, but the responsibility of the, of, of the, of the central bank of the country that does this. So, you know, the issue basically is that the strong yen did not correct the U.S. current account. And you can, this, this, this chart basically shows how volatile it is. It's all in the book, so I'm not going to go into the detail. Now, the importance of Japan, you know, these numbers basically show that Japan was very large and very important. It's no coincidence that, Jap that Thailand was the, uh, major, well, the first one to fail, because Thailand actually borrowed most from Japan, because J the Japanese typically put their auto uh, 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 industries in Japan. And as you know, when the Japanese large factories go, their subcontractors go. And then they also attract the local subcontractors. So when the Japanese banks who follow the Japanese manufacturers, they lend in yen to these Japanese manufacturers. The Japanese manufacturers lend uh, trade credit to their, their own suppliers. The Japanese, uh, the, the Thai uh, uh, guys who prospered with Toyota and all the others, then took their money and went and, uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of and benefited from the stock market bubble up, you know. So I have one very simple rule of thumb for asset bubbles. In Hong Kong, the old rule of thumb for asset bubbles is that when the amate, you know, with your ama, starts speculating the stock market, that's when the market gets overheated. <laughs> but that's symptomatic, not systemic. It's systemic when your local manufacturers gives the core business to the second son to run, and he himself starts speculating on the stock market and the property estate. So when the market crashes, he goes back and discovers the second son has ruined his core business, and he's also lost money in the stock market and the property market, and so they're really hurt systemically. Okay? So that's, a, that, that, that's, that's just to, to show you. So essentially, if you, you know, this, this is a very nice chart which shows that how Asia was networked into the global supply chain. So we had a global supply chain that was essentially you know, hinged on Japan, depended very much on the dollar-yen relationship. As long as it was stable, it was okay. But unfortunately, the dollar-yen was not stable. And you know, the key customer was the US. But you know, it was, uh, uh, and on the finance side, if you really look at the global finance, Asia as a whole is better linked to London and New York than with each other. And it's a, it's, 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 the network was the supply side was networked basically through, you know, north and south all the way to supply U.S. and then ultimately Europe. But finance side, everybody was linked to London and New York rather than with each, each other. That's why today we, we have still have difficulty creating the Asian financial integration because essentially it's so much faster, cheaper to, to route our basic transactions through London and New York than with each other. So the real problem is, that's what I, I figured out, was that we have Asian financial network comprising two standards, and the two standards are inconsistent with each other. 
It would have been better if our Japanese friends had tied and stabilized the dollar yen, but they couldn't do it for because once they got interest rates to zero, they had no lever to control the yen. And so, you know, in a sense, the speculation drove the yen capital flows. You know, it became the tail wagging the dog, right? The speculation was, was tremendous, and we are now in danger of repeating this. So essentially, you know, if you really look at this, when the yen was strong, right, lots of money comes to Asia because, you know, it's no longer cheap to export from a Japanese factory. So you might as well export out of, out of cheaper labor from Thailand and anywhere else. But the minute the yen became weak, the Japanese companies shipped the production back to, you know, everybody prefers to buy a Made in Japan product anyway, right? So you began to shift your production back to Japan, and, you know, the money gets sucked out. But the other problem that people tend to forget was the way the, the, the Basel Capital Accord was tied up with the dollar-yen volatility. This is a little bit technical, but needs to be explained. Where, why did we got the, the Basel Accord? Because in the 80s, Every Western bank complained that the Japanese were undercutting them because of the cheap interest rates, and they, they didn't have uh, adequate capital. Their capital was only 2% or 3% or 4%. This is unfair, right? So they said, we'll have a capital accord, 8%. Now, those banks that didn't have enough capital, they said, we need a tier 2, we use subordinated debt. The Japanese said, we have plenty of unrealized profits on the shares that we own arising from our holdings of Japanese conglomerates, right? When MacArthur broke these companies down, the, the Japanese banks still hold, held 5% of all their key customers. Uh, and they, you know, the, the, the huge rise in the stock market, they had a lot. But the problem was when the yen began to depreciate, they had two problems. First of all, when they had non-performing loans, they were forced to sell these shares. The more they sold the shares, the more the stock market dropped. The more the stock market dropped, the more the inadequate tier 2 capital they had. But the more the yen dropped, the more the dollar loans increased in yen terms, right? But the capital was in yen. So the more the yen sort of depreciated, the more inadequate capital they had. So they were caught in a triple whammy. As the economy slowed, you know, between 90 to 96, non-performing loans began to rise because of the decline in property prices and stock market prices. But as the yen began to depreciate, their capital adequacy was not enough as they needed to make more provisions. So the more they sold shares, the more vicious cycle they got. And once the, once the yen reached a certain level, they had to pull back their loans. And in Thailand, they were told to stop by Sakaki Barasan because you know, Japan had a responsibility. But these Japanese bankers said, if you're going to stop me in Bangkok, where else are you going to stop me? Aha, it must be in... In, in Jakarta, it must be so, you know, it must be in Malaysia, everywhere else, let's pull our, our, our loan back. The minute they pulled the loan back, the local governments did not have, the central bank didn't have enough capital, you know, to, uh, uh, to uh, pay it, and that's how it is. Now, in 2004, Philip Lane and uh, uh, Gian Maria uh, Milesi Ferretti, sorry, published uh, the data, sorry, 2006, the first time they published the balance sheets, international balance sheet of countries. And once they published it, it became very obvious. The best indicator of financial failure is, is there a, a, a number here? Oh, sorry. I beg your pardon. What does that do? Ah, no. ah, okay. Sorry. If you really look at this, Japan has a net international position, greater foreign assets than foreign liabilities. So there's no way it can fail through, you know, sort of not being able to take pay the foreigner. China was that time minus 15% of GDP. Indonesia was 56. Korea was 9. Malaysia 55. Philippines 49. Thailand was 55. So the indicator was very straightforward. Any country reached 55, 50% of, greater than 50% of GDP guaranteed currency failure. Whereas the United States at the moment, 25% of GDP. So it's, you know, somewhere... Middle, mid, middle level. How did uh, uh, Korea fail? Clearly, they mismanaged the, uh, the, the currency reserve and their liabilities side. And, you know, the, the greater the uh, foreign exchange exposure, the greater the mistakes. And, you know, if you really look at the numbers, essentially, uh, you know, Japanese banks and the crisis countries, they took 300 billion, went into East Asia on the left-hand scale, and then 200 billion flowed out. 
right? And so you can see during the, the crisis period when it went, money went in, it went out, and essentially the, 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 the number of uh, uh, bank lendings to Asia was massively cut back thereafter. Now, if you really look at the offshore Hong Kong and Singapore, you would see the massive uh, outflows also. So basically, Hong Kong and Singapore were the conduits through which you know, Japanese banks and then foreign banks and then Soros and all the other funds just withdrew massively. So Soros was not completely wrong. They were not mainly responsible for it. They were the first to leave. You know, and in fact, he complained that he went back into Southeast Asia too early. But uh, you know, my, my, my data proved that wasn't uh, wrong. So how do we compare this Asian crisis and this global crisis? Well, if you, if you do as I've done, you know, all the lists, the comparison, they're the same, the same reason. You know, there was excess liquidity, there was large capital flows, there was yen carry trade, and today there's dollar carry trade. There was asset bubbles, there was excess leverage in the Asia case corporations, in the U.S. case, you know, uh, mortgage uh, borrowers and uh, the financial sector. Was there, you know, crony capitalism? I don't know whether you think that there is regulatory capture or not. Was there premature financial liberalization? Clearly, people didn't regulate the CDOs and the CDSs. Uh, was there lack of transparency? Clearly, nobody understood these CDOs and CDSs. Uh, there was the inadequate supervision? Absolutely. Was there moral hazard? Absolutely. We still got a Greenspan put. We still got a Bernanke put. And the blanket guarantee is a massive uh, subsidy for the financial sector for which the underpaid bankers are still benefiting. Uh, but the major differences, of course, is the policy response. Now, as you know, early on, uh, the fund recommended uh, to raise interest rates and to cut fiscal expenditure, basically drawing lessons from Latin America, the last crisis that happened. But they did not apply the Latin American solution, which was the bank standstill. Now, the, the, the fund admitted the mistake, you know, one year afterwards and quickly reversed, and that's become the standard solution for, a, for the world. As you know, uh, everybody, uh, whatever it takes, cut interest rates to zero, uh, increase fiscal stimulus, and basically has replicated Japanese solution. So what is the Japanese solution? Over the 18 years, the deflation on the asset side of the stock market and the, uh, and the uh, 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 property prices has been replaced by a debt bubble of 200% of GDP. And that debt bubble can only be sustained with zero interest rates. Because if interest rates rises, as you know, the bond market would implode, and the pension fund would go. Uh, and then, you know, the, the fiscal deficit would then also implode, uh, you know, explode, because, you know, the debt servicing becomes very expensive. <clears throat> So we're now in a classic Japanese liquidity trap writ large. And it's a very difficult problem to, to solve because as the Japanese experience has shown, the longer you are, the worse it is. So, you know, in the 80s, I wrote a book for the, you know, I reviewed the bank, 12, bank, 12 country banking crisis in the World Bank. And in 1996, Oxford University Press and the World Bank, you know, uh, uh, published my book on bank restructuring lessons from the 80s. And I couldn't find common elements because I didn't have all the data that later my, 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 my successors in the World Bank uh, got. But there were, I, I, I came to a conclusion that crisis is an event. Bank resolution and crisis management is a process. It's a process of four steps, sometimes simultaneous. It's diagnosis, it's damage control, it's loss allocation, changing incentives. Diagnosis means that you've got to understand what caused this crisis? Just like a doctor. You can't have prognosis if your diagnosis is wrong. The second thing is you must have damage control, right? You must stop the bleeding. And this time around, they have stopped the bleeding. But they've used zero interest rate policies. And so they've papered over the cracks. You know, basically, there's an old Chinese saying, Sui luo shi chu, you know, when the tide goes out, the rocks surface. Well, this time around, you, you flood it again with liquidity. And of course, of course you cover the rocks. But the rocks are still there. The rocks are still there. The real sector problems are still there. And that, in my view, was the mistakes the Japanese made. Because instead of contracting their manufacturing, they expanded it in Asia and then you know, still created the excess capacity and then didn't solve their problems. Ultimately, they think that everybody can grow out of this problem. You can't replace excess leverage 
with more leverage, this time around government leverage, right? And then, you know, the loss allocation, who is bearing the losses? Answer is very straightforward. The people who lose their jobs, the taxpayer and the depositor. Exactly like the Japanese guy, for the next 18 years, you're getting zero interest rate on your deposits. We're going to pay for all, 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 all of us are going to pay for this because we're all in a in, 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 in collective action trap. Who dares to raise interest rates? The more you raise interest rates, except our, our, our Australian friends, right? They, they love to because, you know, they, they are a commodity economy and they run current account deficits. So if they appreciate, their liability actually goes down in Australian dollar terms. So for them, appreciation of the currency is not a bad thing. And since they import most of their fixed, uh, durable goods and fixed investments, it's good for them to have a stronger currency. But for the rest of the world, anybody who tries to raise their uh, interest rates, a ton of money is coming in, right? And so you are beginning to see the beginnings of bubble uh, 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 in the emerging markets, which if we're not careful, we're gonna have a lot of problems. Now, changing the incentives, that's the real issue. If the incentives that created the crisis in the first place are not sorted out, you're gonna have real trouble on your hands. And my question to you, has this changed? I don't think so. So I think, you know, we're in, we're in for some major problems. Now, there were, you know, everybody asked, you know, the, the Queen of England asked the best question. Why didn't we see this? And the British Academy said, well, we're very smart people, including all of us, the rest of the world, didn't see this because we, we you know, we, we were caught up in it, right? But I think, you know, uh, I, I'm not sure they can speak for, you know, uh, others, but people did say that there was problems. The IMF did warn, the BIS did warn, but totally ignored, right? Rubini did warn, it was ignored, right? And so, you know, the problem is that there's failure to remember history, the failure to understand macro, the failure to understand micro, and worst of all, the failure of economic thought. I mean, Paul Grubman said it best, you know, 30 years of macroeconomics, at best useless, at worst harmful. So he said it, I didn't say it. Now my view, you know, from this network analysis is that this crisis should be seen as a network crisis. Because you must look at systemically the real problem is that our academic disciplines have become too narrow. We have so narrow that we make assumptions that it's other people's problems. You know, we're saying that the whole world is, the banking is global in life, but national in death. HSBC, Citibank operates in 150 countries. These banks, AIG, are bigger than single economies. They're bigger than single economies. Right? And that in each country, they're regulated by at least four regulators, all fighting each other over turf. So do you think they can be regulated well? Of course they can't, right? And today, the network effect has a winner-take-all effect, right? So 2025 large complex financial institutions, highly interconnected with each other, basically drive global liquidity. Everything is concentrated in twos or threes. Top two financial centers, London and New York, essentially account for two-thirds of global turnover in derivatives, foreign exchange, etc. All your global financial information is essentially Reuters and Bloomberg. Top three credit cards are Visa, MasterCard, and American Express. The others are minor. Everything is top two or three. Top two or three, you know, websites, Google, Yahoo, you know, uh, and the next in AOL. They, they account for the bulk. Everything is, you know, kind of, you know, relative minor. The minute they conglomerate in this network, they become too interconnected to fail. And not only that, they are too interconnected to fail. Once they allow Lehman to go, they had to rescue AIG because, you know, if they don't rescue AIG, you know, they would not be able to pay Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, blah, 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 right? And uh, the people tend to forget that they are interactive. Now, this is a classic feature of networks that po most people don't understand. And classical economic theory, neoclassical, make the really elementary mistake of assuming that markets have negative feedback. That means once you, you get out of whack, gradually it returns back to equilibrium. George Soros was the first one to point out there is a positive feedback. It's a wrecking ball effect. It goes, the, the feedback goes larger and larger until the whole system blows up. And, you know, the, it's, uh, 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 it, it, you know, neoclassical economic theory asks for frictionless financial markets, try to reduce taxation, friction to zero. 
well, isn't this like a, you know, a windmill that actually you know, spins faster and faster until it's supersonic, and then it brings the whole structure down, right? You can't allow that. I mean, you know, the, the, you know there's, there are limits to the friction uh, uh, issue. So the minute Lehman failed, it was so interconnected that it was instant. It seized up the wholesale market. That's the classic difference between Asia and the present crisis. Asia was a retail bank crisis. This is a wholesale bank crisis of massive derivative amplification. The leverage was through financial engineering, shove all liabilities below the line, shove it you know, into shadow banking, into offshore financial centers, so you guys can see the true leverage in the system, and it's extremely complex. So to conclude, uh, you know, Asia has learned very tough lessons from the Asian crisis. It was very clear from the Asian crisis that we need to have a balanced economy. We can't have too strong manufacturing, too much reliance on exports, you know, uh, too strong real sector, not that strong, over-reliance on banking systems. We need to shift this back to, you know, deeper capital markets. This is easier said than done, huh? because it's a lot of it is to do with uh, knowledge-based industries, you know, culture, etc. You know, everybody said, you know, ha, 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 you know, layman's didn't have good risk management. And I said, with all due respect to all my students in Asia, as with all due respect, you name me one Asian financial institution that has anywhere near the risk management of Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers. Not that the models are good. I'm not talking about the model. I'm talking about the complexity of the systems to manage that kind of risk and sophistication of the dealer rooms, etc. Clearly, you know, it's not quite there. Now, the good news, of course, is after Asia, the corporations have reduced their leverage, not all of them. The FX reserves, the self-insurance has gone up. In fact, it is indeed the self-insurance of Asia which no longer relied upon the global financial institutions. The foreign exchange reserves of China today are larger than the IMF, World Bank, and, uh, and the BIS put together. Okay? All three of them put together, no more than a trillion dollars. You know, Asia has probably four times that in terms of uh, funding. So to a large extent, the global financial institutions, the IFIs, have been marginalized. I'm sorry to say this, but that's a fact of life. Now, the other issue, of course, is that carry trade still exists. And as long as the carry trade and the, you know, cap the capital flows you know, uh, being funded through zero interest rates become very large, people tend to forget that zero interest rate is actually a fixed interest rate policy. Fixed rate policies create volatility in other variables. So when you hold a price constant, the vol volatility goes into other prices and in quantity, especially if that quantity is leveraged. Now, the last real issue is that these bubbles are really difficult to deal with because, you know, classical theory doesn't give us any guidance. And, you know, because, you know, uh, famously Greenspan said, you know, I can't recognize the bubble, I can't identify one, therefore I will solve the damage control, some damage control. You know, uh, uh, unfortunately, the damage is huge. And why is the damage huge? Let me give you the numbers that I talked about from the U.S. Fed. The uh, uh, U.S. is one of the few countries, you know, that produces national balance sheets, sectoral balance sheets. Flow of funds data is very, very good. You really look at it. Uh, the real estate is equivalent to 225% of GDP. Right? Real estate dropped 20%. 20, in 2008, real estate dropped 20%. 20% 20 of 2 to 5% of GDP is 45% of GDP. So how much is the stock market? The stock market is 100% of GDP. How much did the stock market drop? 50%. So 50% plus 45% is 95% of GDP. So the net wealth loss of the United States in 2008 alone was 95% of GDP, plus or minus 100%. How big was the capital of the banking system? 10% of GDP. So are you surprised the banking system suffered all these massive losses? Not surprising. Right? So, you know, once you know these global numbers, that's your macro prudential regulation that our most sophisticated regulators should have watched. But we were so preoccupied with these very complex Basel rules, you know, internal rating models, etc., that we lost the big picture. And I think, you know, there's a, 
very, very big lesson for us that, you know, uh, this crisis has changed many things, not least macroeconomic theory, micro theory, and also, you know, basic policy making. So let me stop here and be very pleased to answer questions. Thank you very much indeed. Um, thank you very much. Let me uh, quickly turn it over for questions. Could I ask you keep your sh questions short and sharp and you speak into the microphone and give your name and uh, affiliation? Thank you. So, uh, all of us agree that uh, now the current crisis in America is financial crisis. But some scholars argue that uh, actually the current crisis in Asia is not a financial crisis. It's a trade crisis. It's a so so trade cr exports, exports. Export crisis. Yeah, exports uh, dropped uh, tremendously. But uh, obviously, all other countries urged China to adopt a more flexible exchange rate and uh, finally open its uh, capital account. So I, I want to know what's your opinion about this? You know, there's a very famous um, saying, you know, the, uh, well, sometimes it's called the winner's curse, I guess. You know, you, you, you better not get what you wish for. The first uh, uh, empirical, you know, uh, issue is that the uh, appreciation of the renminbi need not lead to an adjustment on the global imbalance issue. Need not. I'm not saying that it will or will not. I'm just saying need not, because that's what the yen experience is. Now, you know, uh, when they analyze, unfortunately, a lot of this becomes very emotional. When they analyze the, uh, the uh, uh, global imbalance, what you should do is look at the sectoral side of it. The sectoral side of the balance sheet is basically, on well, the United States is as follows. The housing sector savings started going down towards near zero, right? The government started running deficit, okay? The financial sector started running very large gross liabilities. It has a net savings, right? But it started running unsustainable large deficits. Now, not, not large deficits, large leverage. And so the, the net deficit of the United States, on the, which shows up savings minus investment equal current account deficit, was basically financed by the financial sector. I call it a perpetual leverage machine. Okay? The financial sector financed that deficit through actually creating the liabilities, but it was wholesale, so a lot of it was gross, and nobody paid attention to where that net is. Where, where is the Chinese or the across the other Pacific problem? The, 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 if you really look at the savings pattern across the Pacific, it was first and foremost a demographic endowment. The Chinese population and most of Southeast Asia, East Asia, is relatively young. And when you're young, you tend to save more. And particularly if you don't have a very good social security system, you save over and above than your, what you normally require because you have to save. But actually, most of that global imbalance happened between 2003 to 2007. Why did that happen? Two things, right? First of all, as a result of the Asian crisis, the Chinese amended their ma major tax reforms. For the first time in history, in 2007, 2008, the Chinese treasury had actually, you know, uh, very large, began to have large surpluses on the tax side because the tax collection system improved. Now, of course, the tax collection system improved on the back of a growing economy, and therefore, fiscal savings improved. Okay? Then, the, the, the 1998 major reforms in the SOEs created within the SOEs very large profits, whereas prior to that, they were deficit players. So, you know, you get a situation for a coincidence of savings on the household, the enterprise and the uh, uh, fiscal side on one side, which then created a large current account surplus.
on the Chinese side. Now, not all of it is reflected you know, uh, on, the, on, 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 on the, the U.S. side. Because as you know, the, the current account uh, balance sheet globally does not exactly balance. There's a very large errors in emissions. Nobody knows where that is, probably in the offshore financial center somewhere. But, you know, and, and the underreporting of uh, 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 surpluses and deficits uh, in that uh, regard. But to a large extent, my view has been this crisis has actually shocked the American consumer so that the American consumer will rebuild their savings. So actually, the, 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 the American deficit has now gone down on a quarter-to-quarter -quarter basis, probably about 2.4% of GDP, which is pretty sustainable, in my view, right? And at the moment, the Chinese balance of payments have gone down because of the decline in the export side to a roughly 5% of GDP, right? So uh, uh, the imbalances are much less but uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of emotion in this debate, and people think that you know, by Chinese would increase the the exchange rate, would 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 um, uh, would solve the problem. But I say that you know, you you if you if you get a, what you what you wish for, if you think about it, central bankers have been patting themselves on the back that low CPI was due to their excellent monetary policy, and I give them some credit for this. But the real reason for low CPI over the last 20, 30 years was two essential factors. Number one, emerging markets, particularly China, India, and all the rest of the world, have been selling their cheap labor and natural resources at below market price to a large extent, I mean, you know, relatively cheaply. Okay? So the whole world has benefited. But there's a second reason which, in this one, I don't have empirical. It's only my own observation. Historically, the weather has played much more sort of, you know, deeper problems than we have realized. But the last 30 years, we've virtually had no major droughts or natural disasters, right? So I, my conclusion was, I'm, I may be completely wrong and I'm talking through my hat, the good side of global warming has, you know, Gradual global warming has benefited crops. So good food production together with R&D has kept grain prices low. Now, 2008 is, un, uh, is exceptional. 2008 is exceptional because Australia, which was a major producer of rice, had two years of drought. And rice exports of Australia get, went down to zero, right, almost zero. And the result was world grain rice prices and other grain prices literally doubled on top of the oil price increase. So to a large extent, you know, my, 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 I may be absolutely talking through my hat because I'm not an expert in that area. But in my view is that all you need is another global warming shock. You know, if, for example, there are drought on other grain areas, that's when the inflation will come back because that's not within the control of central banks. Um, thank you. If I could just use my uh, <clears throat> prerogative as chairman just to ask one question. In terms of how you link the Asian crisis to Japan's crisis, is the implicit story that Japan's mismanagement of its own crisis was then exported to Asia? And if so, what does this hold out for regional financial cooperation? Well, I don't think it's, I don't blame the Japanese in this because it's not mismanagement. It's, you know, if an elephant uh, were to, you know, sort of, uh, you know, have a swim in a, in, a, in a smallish pond, are you surprised the smaller fish get, you know, the small, you know, reindeers or whatever get, get affected? It's bound to happen, right? It's the elephant in the boat problem. Uh, so it's, you know, it, it, you know it, I, I don't think it was intentional, but I don't think the real problem was that people tend, people have not understood that national policies have global externalities, right? Increasingly, they've become aware of this. But, you know, that's why, we're, you know, as the world gets smaller and smaller and more networked together, the externalities become dis-externalities for other people, right? And so, therefore, we're moving into this collective action problem. That means my problem is your problem, your problem is my problem. Whether we like it or not, we're linked together, okay? Now, that means that we need to think very differently from a, what I call the compartmentalized 
fragmented policy making. National policies cannot be independent of global impact already, whether you like it or not. Now, whether we should have a nation integration issue is clearly a very major issue. And there are many debates about it. There is the Australian model, there is the APEC model, there is the Asian uh, ASEAN plus three model, the, there is the you know, greater uh, Asian model. There are many, many models. Uh, and um, there, you know, in fact, next week I'm going to talk uh, to my, our European friends whether the European model uh, has an application for Asia. But I come to one simple conclusion, which is what I think is my punchline. I think our discussions over financial integration misses the point. The precondition for financial integration is a global tax system. We currently have a complete system in which global public goods are being financed by voting power, which is a quota increase, or by voluntary aid, but not through taxation. This clearly is unsustainable. You know, I mean, you know, we've, learned, we've now learned after so many financial crises that if somebody has got overborrowed, you don't solve it by more borrowing, right? It's got to be paid for now. And how do you pay for it now? You've got to have a fiscal system. And who sh how should that fiscal system be done? I think Lord Adair Turner has recommended this for a turnover tax, or a, what somebody would call a Tobin tax. And now Gordon Brown has supported it. Christine Lagarde from France has supported it. But I think there are differences of view amongst G20. But I think that must be the absolute di right direction. Because if we don't solve the global fiscal issue, we will never, the precondition of a global central bank or a global regulatory system is that there is a global fiscal system to redistribute gains and losses in the system. If we don't have that, you know, forget about talking about global central banking and global uh, regulatory issues. Thanks. Question? My name is Ko Chin Hua. Point number four and number five, it would appear that, I mean, to me, point number five, four and five have a much greater effect than point number two and three. Because whatever the Asian economies do, they are very small. Whereas you're talking about the effect of carry trade and capital flow, which basically are huge. So is there a way in which the Asian economies can insulate itself from the effect of carry trade and capital flow. So would you go for capital control? Would you go for insulation rather than integration? Well, the carry trade, as I said, the carry trade is leverage play. If the regulators say you're not allowed to leverage the way you would leverage, the leverage cannot play the same kind of high-powered effect on small economies, right? You know, if I put down $3 and I can, I can speculate $100, on, on, on your local currency, uh, and the, your central bank, you know, cannot borrow. It has only that fixed amount of uh, uh, foreign exchange, uh, especially if you have greater liability side. You know, you're, you're, it's a mug's game. Sorry, there's no, there's no way smaller countries can defend, even with a, 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 a variable exchange rate. Uh, you know, it's the, it's the, it's, you know, literally, the, you, you will get this effect. So to me, you know, clearly, the, to avoid this, you have to have very stable domestic economies. You have pretty good regulation. But that pretty good regulation is not adequate because what happens is that you must put sand in the wheels. The more money comes in, the more I believe you should have used this, you, you should use like what the Chileans have done, a Tobin tax. You know, the, the, if, if, if more money goes into the stock market and the property market, you can actually decrease the turnover tax so that you collect enough chips, if I may say so, so that when the market collapses, the government has revenue to deal with this. At the present moment, what happens is the government, de facto, the state subsidizes all the financial institutions to speculate, and when the thing collapses, it's the future taxation that pays for it. The government borrows from the future in order to pay for losses now, right? And we have a basically imbalanced incentive structure. You know, the, 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 the speculators have a great advantage of eating things now at the cost of everybody else paying for it later. 
Now, is this, this cannot be morally you know, uh, sustainable. So to me, there's some kind of fiscal solution has to be the right solution. And, and, and so if we do this, gradually, you know, you cannot leverage infinitely. What with frictionless, frictionless financial markets has enabled us to leverage, you know, a simple subprime can become, you know, an asset, you know, uh, uh, asset-backed securities. The asset-backed securities can be a CDO. It can become a CDO square. It can be a CDO square with a CDS leverage on it. And what is it? What is it? It's still based on the same same piece of mortgage, which unfortunately, if it was a ninja mortgage, the whole pyramid collapses. Unfortunately, you know, your, the guy who sold you all this stuff has laughed all the way to the bank, and the public is paying for it. Right? I think that's what I think most most careful right-thinking people have now understood that basically financial engineering is a massive support by the state, that the, the, it's, it's a shell game in which somebody has taken away the shell. I'm sorry to say this crudely, but that's es essentially what has happened, right? And, uh, and therefore, I believe that the way to stop this is to reduce the leverage and then increase the taxation as the speculation increases. That way, the state has sufficient revenue to actually pay for, you know, uh, public losses when they come, when they happen. It's not very popular because I know all, I lose all my banker friends. But uh, 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 you know, and, 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 and they they all have bonuses, uh, uh, you know, to pay for this. But they obviously, you know, can't carry on the way they're carrying on. Um, thanks. We have a. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, sir, uh, Prof. Charlie. Now, uh, with regard to the proposition that... It looks to be... Yeah, it looks to be that, you know, the magnitude of the problem seems to be unthinkable. And the question is that you yourself understood that, you know, solution is not forthcoming, uh, as it is even right now. Now, in, in the context of essence of substance vis-a-vis uh, -vis the kind of phrenomics, the kind of, uh, you know, uh, trigonomics, financial, you know, currencies and everything else. What, what do you think that is, it's, you know, from our point of view, with the spamming with the, with the worms and the viruses, government is not really having a clear sight as what exactly that need to be corrected. As you notice that you repeatedly say that, you know, the regulatory failures is unthinkable. Now, we're not going to blame the players, the speculators, and so on. What, what happened with the central bankers in this particular situation? As you notice that, as you mentioned, that, you know, repeated lessons never learn. So how are you going to be certain that in the future we will learn that bitter lessons and will overcome that one and for all? Thank you very much. Well, read my book. <laughs> you know, I think uh, I think that's the answer. I mean, my section on my section on the central central bankers who did not fulfil their central banking role to take away the punch bowl uh, has a lot to answer for. Uh, I think ultimately, uh, you know, I'm sorry to say this. I think the system was captured, you know, because it was captured by this massive greed, and everybody had a stake in this prosperity, and nobody wanted to put up their hands and say, sorry, I've got to take away this punch bowl, because he or she will be extremely unpopular, right? Uh, you are now able to see uh, how Brooks Lee Board in the uh, uh, CFTC, when she said you should regulate these derivatives, everybody jumped on her, and she had to, well, she was not renewed. I was there on the other part, aside, uh, you know, and I, you know, I, I, I thought she was right. In my book, I did say she was right. Uh, uh, but, you know, all the, uh, uh, you know, 
a lot of regulators, uh, whom I must say, have uh, after they left, you know, joined all the uh, big firms uh, as advisors or chairman or whatever, uh, and 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 it's, it's it's part of the system. So I I don't have you know uh, my view therefore is it's very sad to say this, but let me say this outright because I can say this when I'm retired and I don't have you know uh, I don't rely upon any of the you know uh, any of, of these financial services. Uh, Wall Street cannot be the model for Asia because they've demonstrated the lack of moral judgment that I think must be the foundation of uh, all strong financial systems. You know, trust, reputation, and integrity. Uh, I, unfortunately, I have to say this because you know I, 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 I I'm, I'm totally aghast at the ability to to, uh, to 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 declare yourself massive profits and bonuses. Uh, when they were freshly rescued by, by taxpayers' money. And I'm also s shocked that they were allowed to do so. I'm just trying to understand that until the day that we have global taxation, until the day that bankers have morals, um, which, which doesn't seem to be any time soon. The, from what I've understood of today's presentation, which I must say is beyond me is, is very little, what I, what I do understand is that the problem is highly complex, that it's spread across multiple countries um, who are all interconnected, and yet there is a lack of a single body who actually has the control over that. So th in all likelihood, this will happen again. Is that right, and where does that leave us in the world, in, in a world where every five, ten years everything collapses around us and even bricks and mortar aren't safe? Well, there's a very, you know, I highly recommend all of you to read John Kenneth Galbraith's book, The Great Crash, 1929. And it, in it, uh, you know, my memory is not so good, but roughly the quotation was some less. You know, one of the paradoxes of life, you know, is who is to regulate the regulator. But even the most, you know, st strangest of factors, the factors, is to make wise those who are supposed to be wise. Okay? To me, I think, you know, a society goes through cycles of greed and fear, and that's understandable. It's within the human genome. You know, that's understandable. And it happens to everybody. You know, it's happened to Asia. It's now happening, you know, the other side of uh, the world. But, you know, uh, we will go through these cycles. But those of us who have looked into Chinese history would also, you know, understand that, that who has gone through all these cycles, that the system imposes on some people who at the risk of their own heads have to tell the authorities, including the emperor, that he is wrong. And in today, since, you know, the world is more democratic, some wise people have to stand up at the expense of their own reputations and heads and say that, you know, you guys, you know, you know better rethink again. So it is the, you know, it, it, it still boils down to, uh, you know, whether you can institutionalize human, human uh, weaknesses, right, the pre prevention of human weaknesses. This is a, uh, uh, you know, unending debate that's not easy. But I, I, again, I commend you to read as academics you know, those we were interested, you know, Eleanor Ostrom's work on collective action. Because I think, you know, this year's Nobel Prize winner is absolutely right, you know, rewarded not to an economist, but to a political scientist. And her argument is that if you don't solve the collective action problem, we are all dead. We have a tragedy of the commons. And so, you know, that's an issue uh, that I think is much more complex, you know. But the simplistic theory that we have had was that, you know, traditional economic problems are either solved by the state or by the market. State has failed through central planning. Market has failed through financial crashes. So there's a third leg and that's civil society. It's individuals working for the public good, right? I have a simple chart which I haven't shown, 
which has a very simple, you know, Boston Consulting matrix, you know, private sector, public sector. Uh, Adam Smith assumed that the aggregation of private greed ends up with a public good. He never said this clearly, but that public good depends upon a selfless public sector that works for the public good. We now know there are plenty of examples to show this, that public sector bureaucracies are very often fighting each other, right, over turf, and so that they result in end up with pub bureaucracies that work for bureauc bureaucratic interests, not necessarily the public interest, right? And so if you have type one, which is self-interested egoist, speaking as an academic, captures type three behavior, which is bureaucratic for bureaucratic interest, then you have a financial crisis on your hands. Because who is going to compensate for that counterfailing power? The answer must be the public service for public good and also private sector, private individuals for public good, the civil society. So, you know, if we don't have that countervailing power, and now we're moving into the area of political science, uh, unfortunately, it will be a one-way street. And, you know, the, the, the best commentator on, uh, you know, Avinash uh, Perso on risk management says, you know, are we surprised we've got into where we are? You know, the minute you go and listen to, you know, all the news that market's going to go up, everybody's piling on the one way up. We, we, we're only looking at things one way, not two ways, right? The market is stable when the number of people who are, who are optimists are compensated by the market who are pessimists. But increasingly, the market is moving one direction. Even the standards are moving in apro-cyclical. And that's what, you know, we need to fix that system. The incentive structure, if we don't change it, will still end up with this high volatility especially when we fix the interest rate at zero. I'm sorry, it's very complicated. But <coughs> it is. Thanks. Uh, we have time for one question. Okay, yeah, thanks. Uh, you, have, you have compared the Asian financial crisis and global financial crisis and emphasized on the similarity between the two crises. Uh, but in Asian financial crisis, uh, chronic capitalism was... Uh, highly featured there. Uh, what's the similarity here in the current financial crisis, uh, the counterpart of the chronic capitalism? Well, you know, I think the fact that, you know, there's too much uh, interrelationships within Wall Street and the uh, lobby groups uh, and the lobby groups changing the laws. I have, you know, read my uh, book, there's a section most people quote Greenspan when they, the, the, the Senate, uh, you know, grilled him, right? And then he made that so-called confession, you know, I didn't see the greed, you know, uh, I'm, I'm in great dismay. But if you read the text, they grilled him even more. And then I, the book I quoted, he said, but I was doing what you guys wanted me to do. So if you, dig, if you dig a little bit deeper, you find all these issues that have not been exposed, right? So for example, you know, uh, uh, I was chairman of the technical committee of IOSCO, right, which is the standard center for securities regulation. In, during 2004, I was not aware that the SEC in 2004 had through a change in the ruling, change in the ruling, remove all capital adequacy for the big investment banks. It was never announced. I mean, not as far as I'm aware. So, you know, as you know, the United States is very transparent. You can go into the website and you can dig it up, right? And if you look into the, uh, 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 you know, sort of uh, proceedings and it's, there, was no, there was no PR. As far as I'm aware, I, I went into the website, I, you know, they have the SEC. I went into everywhere I could find, including the change of the rules. And then I realized, and it's described in my book again, I realized that, you know, if you say, um, if I recall correctly, you know, law uh, XXX actually under FINRA, not SEC rules, under FINRA, which is the self-regulatory organization, 
uh, which affected the 1934 Act, Securities Exchange Control Act, in the appendix 3.1.5, subsection C, you know, it has been amended, the subsection F, G, and that's been voided, etc., etc. By the time you go through it, you finally realize what had happened was that the, the SEC had waived all net capital rules. The SEC in 1934 imposed a 15 times net capital on all securities houses, bar none. Year by year, it was amended slightly, slightly, slightly. What happened in 2004 was that, I'm, but this is a fact, I'm, all I'm quoting you is fact, it's all in the book, right? Mr. Paulson, Hank Paulson, who was then president of uh, Goldman Sachs, applied to the SEC to waive this rule. You know, and uh, uh, eventually, on a, I think it was a 3-2 vote, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the rule was waived. If anybody effectively what the rule said, if you have more than $5 billion U.S. capital, you don't need to comply with this rule. You can rely upon your own internal risk model. What essentially says you can write your own check on how much leverage you have. From that point of 2004 upwards, that was the failure of, you know, um, uh, Lehman, uh, Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers. But immediately the crisis happened. I did a very simple analysis. You can all do this, by the way. You know, the world is so transparent. You can go in the website and dig out all this. I looked at what the average below the line, below the line offshore balance sheet liabilities of the top five investment banks. And to my shock, it was 88 times capital. Now, you know, you may say a lot of this is gross. It's not net. You know, uh, but 88 times, you know, 30 times plus 20 times below the line is 50 times. 50 times capital means if the asset prices move more than 2%, bust. Okay? So you better have a very, very good risk management system. Now, you know, risk management means also you have to lay off your risk to somebody else. And the problem with that somebody else is unfortunately the present market theory, which is the greater fool theory, right? If you're the last one to hold the baby, sorry, baby, you're gone, <laughs> okay? And I think, you know, Bear Stearns, when Bear Stearns failed, Lehman Brothers did not realize he was the last one before, the, you know, the tigers chasing him. And unfortunately, they did not sell Lehman fast enough, uh, and then Lehman Brothers had to go. And when, once Lehman went, I think the whole you know, domino, domino stuff for it. Sorry, I think you have Thank a question. You. So one last question, you know, if we, you have time. If one last tip. I think in, 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 in one sense, the nub of the financial um, regulatory system is coming down to that the health of the financial institutions is related to the health of the markets. So we really can't talk about institutions independent of the functioning of the markets because the markets uh, are being relied on for risk management, which means that we have to look at uh, things uh, in a more consolidated manner. And we really don't have the models to, to think through uh, things with that. But we have the data. The data is all before us. But, you know, uh, you, you must read uh, Friedhoff Capra's work called The Turning Point. Right? He wrote three books, which is brilliant in my view. The uh, Power of Physics, he was a physicist and system scientist. The Turning Point and the Web of Life. And, you know, to, he, he said that, look, you know, the real problem today is that economics is still in the Newtonian phase. Right? It's still linear in thinking. It's still reductionist. It's still compartmentalized based upon, you know, sort of very simple assumptions that you can, you know, kind of deduct greater truths from these very simple assumptions. Whereas a system-wide thinking requires you to be integrative, requires you to be think in terms of cooperation, quality instead of quantity, partnerships instead of dominance, you know, society instead of self, right? That, you know, if we don't understand this correctly, we're heading for a big fall. And that's exactly what's happened. 
So, you know, it's not that we don't have the data. It's how you interpret the numbers and how you, uh, 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 you know, uh, ensure that the values are, are correct. And unfortunately, I think, you know, uh, what has happened under this unfettered finance is that they've allowed excessive greed to completely destroy the system. And then, unfortunately, they bailed out that greed. And, the, and, you know, my worry is that that incentive structure sends a very bad signal because it's the real sector that pays for this. So, you know, you, you, if you really think about it, you know, uh, financial engineering is just trading pieces of paper until the prices just go higher and higher and higher because it relies upon low and lower interest rates. And it relies upon the central bank to maintain that growing bubble by lowering interest rates. And as interest rates go lower, the risk spreads instead of increasing to compensate goes smaller and smaller and smaller. So we now have not incremental risk adjustment, risk distribution. We have stochastic. You know, one big event happens, the risk spread blows up, the black swan effect, and the whole system goes bust, and you give it back to the state to bail you out. And unfortunately, the individuals who do this are the ones who are profiting most by changing the accounting standards, by changing the regulatory standards, all to their benefit. You know, and we still haven't fig figured out how to do this, unfortunately. So until the real sector sorts itself out, the financial sector is only papering over the fundamental issues. That, unfortunately, is my <coughs> conclusion. And uh, so on the, on the real sector side, you know, until the real sector begins to adjust, you know, I, I, I still make my reservations on whether we've, we've, we've actually seen green shoots. Well, look, uh, thank you very much. Let me just uh, end on, on one thought and one, one question, perhaps. You, you've covered a great deal of ground. You've given some very uh, stimulating ideas for thought. I'm wondering how plausible, how credible do you think it is for official sectors to try and make some of these large financial institutions safe to fail? Because you talk about taxing financial transactions, financial institutions. But arguably what we have at the moment are some big implicit subsidies. And there is a, a group of thinking that suggests that what we need to be able to do is credibly say to some of these institu institutions, you can fail. Now, obviously with living wills and the like, there are attempts to do this. But do you think these are credible? Or is it that we'll need to somehow think of more imaginative ways to impose market discipline? I, th I think, you know, uh, some of them really have become too big to fail. Corporate governance cannot stop, you know, uh, at the present moment, individuals making very big decisions that ultimately brought these very big institutions to failure, right? We've seen that. Uh, I don't want to mention particular names, but, you know, there was clearly some... Uh, uh, you know, the boards, corporate governance hasn't uh, stopped this. So, it, you know, it is complex. But ultimately, it still, it still boils down to should, would, should you allow these institutions to become so large that a whole nation has to mortgage itself for the next 30, 40 years, you know, to pay for the mistakes of the few, right? And in the Iceland case, I think they've decided that that's the limit. You know, so you really need to, until you bear the pain, it's the, it's the price of growing up. I think in Asia, we grew up when we realized the policies that we, we entered into prior to 96 were unsustainable. And I think, you know, we run the market test of the unfettered finance, and it's been mark to market. You know, the, it's been proven to be uh, intellectually and morally, unfortunately, I can say this, bankrupt. And so now we really need to rethink. And that's why this talk is so complicated because it's, it, you know, we have to shift our mindsets very differently into this game. Uh, I don't know how to do it. I mean, all, I'm just, all, I, all I can say is to, you know, that uh, I've at least, at least made an attempt to do so. Thank you very much. If we could just show our appreciation to that.
And this is uh, Andrew's book, and I, I think uh, we have the market to market. Thank you very much. We have My, the book. Uh, actually, that if you don't like the book, throw the book at me. <laughs> we have the book uh, on sale on the corridor, so Andrew will be happy to do a signing for you if you want to get a copy. Thank you.